Brian Keating, a professor of physics at UC San Diego. I got two physics questions I'm hoping you can answer or chime in on. So I study the cosmic microwave background radiation, which is the sure. sort of afterglow of the Big Bang, which discovered 65 years, 60 years ago or so. And yep. this radiation is thermal in origin, and we are applauding your efforts in the astronomy community to make the Starlink satellites dark for optical astronomy. But we microwave astronomers who use signals, we're trying to detect this afterglow of inflationary gravitational waves in yeah. Q-band, essentially in Q-band. And there's really no way to block out a million Kelvin equivalent signal that you're transmitting with Starlink. I'm wondering, is there any way we could work with you in, in, from the South Pole or Chile where our observatories are located to have selective availability or, or some way? Because once this channel is gone, we'll never get it back. And and this is, you know, potentially precluding a view into the you know inflationary origin of the cosmos. So I know it's a very important to you and we're appreciative of the astronomy efforts and optical astronomy, but microwave is a totally different ballgame. Sure. I, I do think long term the, the right place for telescopes uh, or really any a receiver is in orbit or you know, basically space so you don't have sure. express work. And as what you know, as Starship starts launching, we can put up some pretty big Telescopes, yeah. Or we have, yeah, ten meter diameter telescopes. So pretty hard to put, and they don't really unfold the way that Webb would. But I mean, I think it would be something that you know, selective availability. I'm basically blanking it over the South Pole. We only have two locations on Earth where we would need to have it unobstructed. Okay, would you say like basically just stop stop transmitting just over these? Yeah, um, the two observatories. Yeah, in the Atacama Desert in Chile at seventeen thousand feet, and the South Pole, Antarctica, which is yeah. You know, place we'd love to take you, by the way. Simons Observatory, Jim Simons funded it, and the National Science Foundation funds the South Pole Observatory called BICEP. So if you have any resources yeah. you could put me in touch with, it would be really appreciated. We have a technical update every week, so I'll ask about any observation and microwaves spectrum in Atacama and the Antarctica. So yeah, we don't wish to in any way lead the progress of science. That would be awesome. Thank you. And I have one more question just related to physics and AI and related to Catherine's book, which brought us all here together tonight. So Catherine, congratulations, Mazel Tov on the book. So the book's called No Apologies. One of the things I hate most about chat GPT, woke GPT is, you know, you'll ask it some question. I'll say, you know, what did Brian Keating write? And I'll say, you know, losing the Nobel Prize, correct. You know, into the impossible, correct. And then I'll say, a brief history of time. No, that's not correct. And I'll say, no, that's not right. I didn't write, that's Stephen Hawking. And then I'll say, I apologize, I apologize. I hate that. I hate the, I, I want the Catherine Brodsky, no apologies. But it made me think about a true Turing test. And I want to get your opinion on, I've asked Nick Bostrom and David Chalmers and your greatest ideas and thinkers, Peter Diamandis, our mutual friend. I said, do you know what Einstein called his happiest thought, Elon, that gave him shivers and, and titillated him? Do you know what he said that was? He said, yeah, it's, it's PG, don't worry. <laughs> he said, <laughs> uh, <laughs> He said it was that an observer in free fall would experience no gravitational force. And it made me think, because to what extent could a computer or some silicon or even quantum computer, could it even have either a happiest thought or B, experience the sensation, a visceral sensation of free fall? So I'm wondering if we could propose another, you know, kind of Turing test, a, a different de definition of AGI, which would be actually coming up with new laws of physics or new complete paradigms of physics rather than just, you know, physics is a base layer of reality. I mean, you always right. quote that, right? So what to what extent could we redefine AI as when it becomes generally intelligent, when it can experience happy thoughts, free fall and other things like that? So curious about your thoughts. Well, I think you certainly uh, have AI would think it's, a, would not realize it's in a simulation which may be the case for us right now, and that would have a, you know, a true physics engine fall in a way that a human would fall and thus experience sensations in the same way. I do think there are some the simulation hypothesis does explain some elements of quantum mechanics, such as, you know, only collapsing the probability distribution when you look at something. Like, why would something be LHC when you look at it? Well, if it's rendering in real time, then that's actually how a video game works. Like, if you're in, in a video, like, let's say, you're in World of Warcraft or something, and you walk through a forest and uh, there's a, a rat and a rat appears. But before that, was there a rat or not a rat? There was only a probability of a rat. And the rat only became real when you when you looked in that direction, that collapsed the probability space and the rat appeared. So so I think conversion theory actually explains a lot of 
makes that seem quite mysterious, the, sh- the Schrodinger's cat situation. But it requires okay. infinite compute, right? Because they could always say who simulates the simulator. Infinite <laughs> regress, right? It does beg the question of where is the, where is the simulator running? Yeah. And, and it may be that, that you have a whole series of nested simulations. But at some point, there is the unit thing. But ultimately, the physical reality, I mean, all these things are going to be running on a rocky planet somewhere, right? That doesn't have infinite copper. It doesn't have infinite mineral density to retrieve. So, I mean, there are planetary limits to growth, as, you know, the Club of Rome would call it. Don't those provide? I mean, you can't imagine, you know, changing the physical reality of an Earth-like planet. You you can't imagine these simulations running on something very different from an Earth-like planet. It's not going to run on a Boltzmann brain. So... At some level, it needs physical reality. And so, again, you can't break the law of the physics. So how does it get around the planetary resource problem? You can't make an infinite number of, pl- of paper clips on a finite planet. The universe may seem infinite to us, but frankly, if I was creating a simulation of this reality, I would, you know, I would put the stars far enough away that we do not have to simulate the, the details of the planets. And in fact, that is the situation. So you really just have to simulate with high fidelity what is observed on our planet. A much easier task than trying to simulate world reality. And I was joking that, you know, when the James Webb telescope went up, that maybe the reason for the delays was that the the simulators needed to bring more computers online, because now that we could see further, they needed to improve the fidelity of their simulation. So like their equivalent of Amazon Web Services or something. If I wasn't at least pretty good at physics, then the rockets would explode and the cars wouldn't work. Because physics is a very harsh judge. I mean, I like to say that, you know, physics is the law and everything else is recommendation. Meaning that, you know, you can't break physics, but plenty of people can break the law. And uh, if, if you break your physics here, you're either wrong or, or, or you need a Nobel Prize, but most likely you're wrong. You like, can I ask you a question as uh, a father of half as many kids as you have? Sure. So I've heard it said, you know, you want to die on Mars. And our mutual friend, Lord Martin Rees, said, I just hope it's not on impact. And I, I agree with that. Uh, being a father, you've got that cute kid probably right next to you. I mean, He's on my shoulders take... right now. Yeah, I mean, but you have other kids too. And I, I mean... To say goodbye to a child is, I mean, you don't, I don't have to tell you that it's the most painful thing you could ever imagine. But wouldn't you have to? I mean, wouldn't that be kind of the ultimate going away on a business trip if you were to do that? I don't know. I, I find it hard to go away on a trip, but I know you sit, you take your kids with you. I got one of my girls who right here with me right now, and she doesn't want to go to bed. I mean, what would you do? I mean, could you really say goodbye to some of your kids or some of the people you love? Maybe your mom and never see her again. Well, I don't, I don't want to say goodbye. I think we don't have to worry about that for a few more years. Okay. I think so, too. Plus, maybe they'll want to come on the trip, right? You don't know. Yeah. And maybe it'd be quicker so you can come back if you want. Yes. You fear a lot of things in your life, but most don't happen. That's very true. Very true. Thank you, Elon.